Mr Kirby was walking along the Murray River in 1839 and he came across a fisherman who was sitting on a weir that he'd constructed uh, into the river and had made it in such a fashion that all the water was channeled through the weir and uh, any fish that wanted to move up the river had to do so through a, um, a small net that had been placed in the river. Mr Kirby sat down under a tree and watched this operation uh, for some time and noticed that uh, there was a stick arrangement anchored into the, the ground, very fine, narrow uh, stick with, uh, and being tied down so it had a lot of tension on the, the string and it, the, the tie disappeared into the water. Uh, he did, wasn't sure what was going on, whether it was a fishing rod or what the arrangement was, but um, then he noticed that a fish, the, the stick released and a fish flung over the fisherman's shoulder and landed behind him. And um, Mr Kirby noticed that the man was aware that he was being observed and casually reached behind him, picked up the fish and tossed it into, the, into a basket and then leant back on his elbow and waited. This went on, um, Mr Kirby's observation for an hour or more and every few minutes another fish would be flung back over the fisherman's shoulder and he would, with great insouciance, toss it into the basket. Um, Aboriginal people sometimes um, get a bit nervous when um, Abor other Aboriginal people use big words but um, I'm a, a bookish sort of a person and uh, I grew up with words and I love them and Aboriginal people traditionally spoke seven or eight languages. We were the great wordsmiths of the world and uh, one day we'll recover that pride um, in, the, in the words. So I'm happy to use insouciance because that's exactly what Mr Kirby observed. This man, aware of being observed, uh, was proud of his achievement and a bit disdainful of this other man watching him. He didn't even speak to the man, but he did observe how the, the tie from the, the, the springy stick was tied onto a noose. Every time a fish swam through the noose, it triggered uh, the peg that was holding the noose down and it flung the, the fish out of the water. This was engineering and the man was very proud of his achievement. A man called Mitchell on the Narran River in the, on the Queensland-New South Wales border around about the same time uh, rode through grasslands up to the withers of his horse, rode through those grasslands for nine miles and throughout the nine miles grass was stooped like the old English stooks. It was set in piles and he rode through this for nine miles. Leichhardt was another man who visited that country and disappeared. Another man called Gregory uh, came and followed in Leichhardt's uh, footsteps and hoof prints and um, they camped because they were tired and felt they were lost and they saw Aboriginal people on these grasslands and they witnessed them for three days while they repaired their carts while they fixed up their horses' saddlery, while they recovered their spirits and their health. For three or four days, Gregory's people witnessed people harvesting grain. Then he saw a phenomenal thing. He saw people sowing grain and the next day saw people irrigating that grain. Later on, the harvested grain from the last season was sorted into stores and some of it was put in pouches and worn around the neck and um, uh, was destined to be traded to neighbouring peoples. 
This was um, a trade in grain. Mr Smith from the Northern Territories, part Aboriginal man, came across a number of people building what looked to him like a dam. He watched very carefully and uh, very circumspectly because these weren't his people and he, he stood back a mile off from this project and just watched. Eventually the uh, old men motioned him into the camp and um, he asked them about the, what they were doing and he said, oh, you know, we're going to do another one tomorrow. You can watch that too if you like. And the next day another dam was built and that dam um, had an exit from it into some channels which ran through flat ground and those people were irrigating a crop. Ernest Giles' brother, a bit earlier than this, was travelling through the Northern Territory and came across huge stores of what he discovered was grain um, stored up in platforms three metres off the ground. Each of those stores weighed a tonne. He'd never seen anything like it before, but it didn't stop him stealing it because, once again, he was an explorer, he was lost and he was hungry. So he took the grain that had been stored uh, for the harvesters. There was a woman of Cape Otway, and it was me who discovered her secrets. Because near my home, uh, near the Cape Otway Lighthouse at that time, I came across a, a midden that had been exposed by uh, a great storm. I Cape Otway is pretty good at having great storms. And the face of the midden had sheared away and exposed a whole lot of tools. And uh, there were the normal tools that you would find, axes, scythes, hammers, augers, bone spear points for sewing clothes. Um, but there was one little stone about that big, top, like the size of a top of a matchbox, and I couldn't work it out. It had um, various holes drilled in it of di different dimensions, had notches on the side, and it had straight lines. Um, and I couldn't work out uh, what this was, and I worried about it for days and days and days, and eventually my mother came down she was living in a pile of bay not far away. My mother is blind, deaf and epileptic, but quite well. Um, and I gave it to my mother. I said, what do you reckon this is? And she felt it. And she said, oh, this is a sewing kit. She felt the holes and she felt the lines. And she said, I used to have one like this when I was a kid made out of tin. And it was for um, sharpening needle points, bone needle points, um, getting an edge uh, on the fine side of the needle and uh, um, notches for cutting twine. It was a very, very intimate thing and I was more or less ashamed to be handling it. I, I did so in ignorance, but it wasn't really my business. Um, I returned all those things uh, to the site and they're still there. I go back every now and then and and see them. Another man called Todd in 1835 was one of the very first white people to visit Victoria. He was um, supposed to be guarding the land for uh, John Batman. John Batman had um, gone back to Tasmania because his nose was falling off John Batman, the great um, discoverer of Victoria, uh, had syphilis and his nose was falling off. Um, he went back to Tasmania and, um, and there was a reason why he had syphilis and uh, there was a reason why a lot of Aboriginal people in 
Aboriginal women in Tasmania had syphilis too. Um, Todd was uh, told to wait there and not upset the Aboriginal people. And so Todd wasn't a bad sort of a man. You know, if he was looking after your milk bar or your pub or your hardware store, you could rely on his abilities because he just seemed like a decent sort of a bloke. And he uh, talked to the Aboriginal people as much as he could, learnt some words, seemed to be kind, um, gave people the things that they seemed to be interested in, accepted what he was given in return. It, it was, you know, nice warm weather. Everything seemed to be going pretty well. And Todd, in his spare time, because he seemed to have a lot of it, uh, was happy to fish with the people, but also to draw, uh, draw, make drawings of them as they fished or as they uh, participated in other cultural activities. But one of these drawings is a line of women and girls bending over with sticks about that long. And it's a trans transformative piece of Australian art. Not very good, um, but it's transformative because the women were digging up a yam pasture field that if you look at the scale is probably six, seven acres wide. It's a big paddock and it's full of yam daisy and that's what those women were doing. They were digging up the yam daisy, selecting the mature tubers and pressing them down. Uh, when they selected their tubers, they pressed down the remaining tubers um, to regenerate the crop. And you can see all this in Todd's drawing and we're very, very fortunate to have it because the next year there was no yam daisy in Victoria. Wherever a sheep had roamed, they came across the yam pastures, they, they gravitated to them because they were such good eating. And sheep, because of their dentition, uh, are able to crop the basal leaves of yam daisies right down to the ground. A kangaroo can't do it, a wombat can't do it, a bandicoot can't do it, but a sheep can. They wiped out the yam daisy uh, in one season. You hardly can find a yam daisy in Victoria now. Some people are growing them commercially. Um, but if you go along the railway tracks around Werribee and places like that, you'll see uh, plenty of it. So what do you call what all these people saw? What I saw, what Mr Kirby saw, what Mr Mitchell, what Mr Gregory, what Mr Smith, what Mr Giles, um, what Mr Todd, what were they looking at? I'm having a battle at the moment um, with senior academics in Australia which I'm losing profoundly because I'm not an academic. I'm, I'm just a bloke who lives in the bush. Um, but I can read and these are the things I've read and I'm saying to people, as I'm saying to you, I'm proselytising, you know, I'm using you. Um, it looks to me as if these are not the habits of hunter-gatherers. Aboriginal people are called hunter-gatherer. What's all this business of irrigating crops, harvesting crops, having granaries of over a ton in several parcels, trading grain, ha uh, cultivating yam pastures, having 3,000 kilometres of eel races around the town of Kuroi in Victoria. What is going on? This isn't hunter-gathering. So I'm asking you what you think. If we can't use words like horticulturalist, because I've had the ruler over my knuckles for suggesting such a thing, we can't say tilling. I was admonished for that. We can't say apparently farming. We can't say cultivation. What is going on? I know it's not hunter-gathering. 
Aboriginal people in that era knew it wasn't hunter gathering. Maybe the term hunter gathering is just very convenient for people who wanted to take the land. Because if you're hunting and gathering, your possession of the soil is itinerant. <laughs>